ask you guys um, who some of your role models are. Um, I won't ask you right now, I'll, I'll ask you second Go semester. Through. When I ask that question to classes, I get oh. stuff like Batman, you know, Spider-Man. Goku! Like, you know, like any, any, like, any humans? And then we'll kind of think about it and we'll say some, uh, uh, MLK. Yeah, the guy's been dead for 50 years. Anybody, like, recently who we can think of? Yeah, but it's a problem, man. If we have no living role models, Oh, living. Then, yeah, if they're, if they're, I mean, and again, it's not bad to have uh, historical role models, of course. How about fictional ones? This is a problem. <laughs> Dang it! Because, because, it, because what, it, what, what does that message tell you? Where does your role model exist? In your brain. No, not in fantasy. Just there. It, it only exists in fantasy. When you're which high. Mean, which means you can't even live. Which means you can't even live up to this ideal of, of, of a Batman or Spider-Man because they, they're, they're a fictional thing. You can't possibly live up to that. Fictional. Or so it allows us to step back and go well. No one's perfect, but if you can look up to someone like a, like a Martin Luther King Jr., and by the way, look up to them for, these, for, the, for the proper reasons. This is a guy that by the time he was 27 years old had an earned doctorate. It's a funny thing. We, we, we refer to him as, as, as Dr. King. Did anybody know his doctorate is in? Yeah. Oh, wait. What? Oh, you know, not doctorate? You said yes, what is it? Oh, wait. You're interrupting to say yes, what is it? Oh, wait, I'm trying to remember. Darn, I had it, and now it's gone. Oh, you never knew. So don't, so don't throw it in like that. His PhD was in theology. He was a minister. That was right. It was, it was, it was, it was in divinity. Probably speaking, it's in divinity. The PhD in divinity. And it's weird. I, I wonder, why don't we refer to him as, as Reverend King? Why we, you know, we stick to the doctor thing? But anyway, this is a guy who was 27 years old, was able to show up in Alabama, look around with people he's never met before, and say, all right, guys, we're going we're gonna to protest. And people are like, that. I'm glad you're here, man. We've been getting the shit kicked out of us for years. Let's go kill some people. No, no, we're not going to do that. Um, Ours. We're going to walk down the street. Oh, I got you. Walk down the streets with bats and guns. Let's do this. No, 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 no. We're going to walk down the streets with... Um, with we're going to sing. Signs. We're going to sing. What do you mean we're going to sing? And no weapons, by the way. Huh? But if we do that, well, they're going to attack us. And he's all, that's the plan. Let's go. Oh, and then when they attack us, we mob them. No, when they attack us, we don't even fight back. Wait, 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 wait. So you want us to walk down the street and, and make targets of ourselves and get attacked and do nothing about it? Yes. No. And you think that that's going to bring about change? And he's like, uh-huh. Who in their right mind would believe that that would bring about change? Well, nobody in their right mind. But, but people in their philosophical mind. This isn't an idea that's new with King, by the way. It starts with a guy named Henry David Thoreau. And King reads his essay called Civil Disobedience, and in that essay it essentially argues that the only thing that you can properly do against a state that's oppressing you is stop going along with it. Because what's the state going to do? Throw you in jail? Fine, they throw you in jail. How many people do they have to throw in jail? How much does it cost them to do that? And then when people see you getting thrown in jail, they didn't deserve that. That's how you get now masses of people to go ahead and change things. And if you think masses of, of, of public opinion doesn't change things, you haven't been paying attention for the past week. Anybody, anybody happen to know what are the, the new CDC guidelines with, with masks and vaccines and stuff like that? No. They've dropped everything. They've just said, ah, unvaccinated should be treated the same as vaccinated. No quarantine. Masks are unnecessary. We actually know that they're counterproductive. And this is kind of going by, slowly by the wayside. Did the science change? No. In fact, the CDC specifically said that this is in response to public opinion. In other words, people have just basically said, we're tired of it, we're not doing it anymore. So now the state comes along and says, okay, we're going to do what the people are, we're going to, we're going to advise you to do what you're already doing anyway. And then we're like, okay, thanks. Yeah. Because it's a massive public opinion of people who just decided not to go along with something. And by the way, I'm not saying we should or shouldn't. Yeah. I'm just saying that you can go read the, the press releases from the CDC, this is exactly what they said. And so, you know, Henry David Thoreau comes up, has this idea where he just says, I'm not going to go along with the state. And lots of people since then have kind of gone along, gone along with that. So he said, so MLK just says, I'm sorry, MLK Jr., not his dad. He says, we're going to go ahead and just, and, and just participate in life. And if the state comes against us, and they come against us. How is it that a dude who's 27 years old can show up with people who spend their whole lifetime fighting against stuff like this and convince them to do that? That tells you something very important about the man. It tells you something also important about the man, that the way he dies is he's standing on a balcony. Standing on a balcony. And he's in town because he's supporting striking garbage workers. I want you to think about this for a second. This is a guy who at 27 had an earned doctorate and could convince people to do this, to behave this way. How much money do you think that guy could have made in the, public, uh, in the private sector? 
He started a company. He invested. The guy wanted to start a corporation. How much money do you think MLK Jr. could have made in his life? Yeah, and, that, and that's being conservative. Millions. I mean, that guy would have made hundreds of millions of dollars because he had the ability to motivate people and get people to do things. Why? Was, was he grabbing people in headlocks and no. saying, we're walking down the street? No, he used words. And through words, he's able to do this. And if you can understand that, he, and then, and anyway, you realize the power this guy had. And yet he dies with very little. He doesn't make millions off of it. He dies on a balcony because he's in town striking, uh, supporting striking garbage workers. You know, and that's, that's a phenomenal character. And that's a guy that, unfortunately, you can't look at as a living person and say, wow, I can admire that person. Unfortunately, we have to look at him as a dead person. He dies at 39. We have to look at him as a dead person and say, wow. And then you start to understand something really important, which is that if you want to change the world, you're going to get shot. <laughs> All right, look at King Jr. He wants to change the world. What happens to him? Shot. He gets shot. Dang. Yeah. I really like John F. Kennedy wants to change the world, gets shot. Thank you. Wants to change the world, gets shot. What else? John, John Lennon. Oh, he's God. Taking, he's taking some time away from his busy wife beating schedule to sing about love and peace. No. And then he, uh, he gets shot. <laughs> oh. I think that was for a different reason, but. Yeah. Man. Then you've got and Jesus. He doesn't get shot. He, he got. He got. He gets he, nailed. Yeah. They really nail on him. Right? But that tells you something very important, by the way, because this is a person who's. Regardless of whatever your religious beliefs are, most of us look at, at, at Jesus and think of him as being a, a pretty okay character. Yeah. And yet this is a guy that when he's, when, he's, when he's born, there's no room for him in the city where he's supposed to be born. He has to be born in the manger outside of town. And when he's growing up, there's no room for him inside of the city. He has to be brought up outside. When, he, when, he, when he's in his family, there's no room for him in his family. Even when the guy dies. There's no room to be buried inside the city. He has to be buried. This is a guy who perpetually was living outside of the city, outside of society. Now, as much as we look at him today and say, wow, he's a holy guy, you know, this is a guy who's, who's, who's tortured and executed with having absolutely no, no cause, completely 100% innocent of anything. Even the people who accuse him recognize that he's innocent. And so it's a funny thing that we look at a guy like that and we say, how is it that the world could not get along with the holiest man who ever lived? And yet somehow that same world gets along just fantastically well with you and me. Hmm. Is it the world couldn't get along with MLK, and yet somehow gets along with you and me. The world couldn't get along with fill in the blank, and then it gets along fantastically well with you and me. Now maybe it's because they've changed the world in some dramatic way. And so we owe them a certain debt. And maybe the debt that we owe them is to live in the way that they were, that they were espousing. Otherwise, they died for nothing. Or maybe it's worth looking at, do we really follow them? Because if the world couldn't get along with them and yet it loves us, I don't know. That's, maybe that means that we're, we're compromised. Maybe it means that we should take the posters off the walls unless we're really going to follow the people who say these things. Because they gave their lives to us out of love. And it was something that... Yeah, I guess they certainly had, but I wonder, is it something that we really wanted? Well, thanks for your sacrifice, but I'm going to go do something else. Yeah, it sounds like one-sided. Yeah. And that's the thing we're talking about here. That's one-sided. That you know, we don't feel like we've been let down, so therefore we can't really accept the support and the affection. Um, I like this one right here. I want the affection and support, not from you. Because we know why, not from you. Because that we, we're worried that that person is going to expect something back. Or... Even then, maybe the love and support you want, you want it from someone who's, who's close to you. It, it matters more to you. Um, an excessive amount, uncomfortable. I laugh at this because uh, there's a, couple, a, a few teachers who, who are here that we, we joke about teachers who are like this. I'm sure some of you have that teacher mm -hmm. who come to you. What's going on with you? Are you okay? <laughs> I'm not going to say names. Listen, I'm here for you, okay? I know what you're going through. Do you really? Listen, and what, what I hear, whenever I hear people talk like that, what I hear is, I want to be your friend. <laughs> Please, listen, I know that no one listens to a single goddamn word I say, so at least give me some meaning in my life where I can, and that's probably, oh, that's Jesus I'm just saying that's Christ. a totally unfair way of, of, of framing it, but I, I don't know. Listen, if any of you guys are going through something, let me know. I can help you. I'm here for you, all right? But I'm also not going to go around like, 
hey, I noticed that you're just not. I mean, if you're sitting here, like, if you're in class and you're crying, <laughs> once I get done making fun of you, <laughs> I'm going to let you go outside. And if you're out there for a while, I, I might go, like, I should go check. <laughs> I'll go out and check. I'll be like, you cool or what? <laughs> <laughs> you good? Yeah. You good, man? Like, you good? And if I see something obviously quite clearly wrong with you, I might say something, but for the most part, um, don't raise your hands, but I wonder if anybody in here is not going through some shit today, or at least this week sometime. I imagine everybody in here is. And if you, if, if you need something, if you, if you need someone to talk to, whatever, I'm, I'm, for, absolutely, I'm here for you. I can listen to you. But I'm not going to be that person who goes around and is like, come on, tell me your deepest, darkest secrets so I can get some sense of validation from it. Peace. I do, you know, I mean, I care about you. And uh, it's not just because you're a student, it's because you're a human being. And at this point, uh, not to be an asshole, but please understand where I'm coming from when I say this. If you come up to me and you're crying and you say that you need something, I'm going to treat you the same way I'm going to treat a homeless person who walks up to me and is crying and says that they need something. I'm going to treat you that way based off of, the, based off of your humanity. The fact that you're a human, that you're suffering, that you need some help. I'm there. And as time goes on, and as I get to know you guys more, you guys will go up a rung above homeless people because you're my students. And I know you. We got money. Yeah, but I haven't even asked you guys to write the letter of introduction yet, so, you know, I don't really know you super no. well. And of course, whether it's right or wrong, the people that we know, we, we, we raise them up on that rung of people who need help. But, and by the way, those teachers who do stand there, I go, come on, what do you need? What do you? They have their place. Because there are some of you who do need that kind of pulling and supporting. So I make fun of them, and they, they probably sit in, my, in their room right now, and they're like, oh, and then maybe you come along like Scanlon, and you're like, oh, go ahead and cry, and you punch him in the shoulder. And they're making fun of the opposite uh, approach. And that's um, what makes it so wonderful that we have a yin and yang thing. Ah! <laughs> I'm sorry. Control the backpack. Control the backpack. Maybe there's a yin and yang in there where we can get that along. But it means giving something that you don't have, maybe these things here, to someone who doesn't want it. Maybe they don't want it because they're uncomfortable with it. Who knows? You know, but otherwise, you kind of give those things to the person, not because you want something back out of it, but because of this thing called love. Okay. <laughs> That's a weird kind of love from there. <laughs> I imagine you would think it's strange if you've never given it before. Uh, Damn. Damn. Questions? What a Comments, concerns, complaints, please. <laughs> <laughs> what am I doing?